Okay, so moving to the next section of our um, digestive tract. We have the mouth, we have the esophagus, we have the stomach, we have the small intestine. Now we're moving on to the large intestine. So here's our large intestine. There's that end of the ileum. As this comes in, the connection between the ileum and the large intestine is called the ileocecal valve. Why? See this part that kind of dips down a bit? This is actually called the cecum, okay? So you've got the cecum and the ileum coming together. That's the ileocecal valve. Again, a sphincter muscle that opens and closes and regulates how fast things move from the ileum into the large intestine. This right here, this little wormy thing, this is our veriform appendix. So the fact that it's wormy in shape means that it's very easy for it to tie in a knot, which means that it kills itself, basically. By tying in a knot, it cuts off its own blood supply, meaning that tissue death eventually happens. When tissue death happens, yeah, you're done for. So that's one of the reasons why appendicitis happens. Okay, we've got the colon from the cecum. The colon goes up, sideways, down, kind of does a little squiggle. This is the ascending colon, transverse colon, remember transverse means across, descending colon, and then if you turn this around, this makes kind of an S shape. This is the sigmoid colon. If you follow the direction of the fecal material, those directions make sense, okay? As we come up, see how it's bent right here? This is called the right colic flexor. Remember, every organ that we're looking at, it would be as if it's in us. So this would be the right-hand side. As this comes across, okay, going that direction, this transverse colon, I bend again. This is the left colic flexor. This is my left hand. We also have this strip looking thing right here. This is actually called the tenai coli, okay? And every bump and lump that you see here is called a hostrum, okay? If you want to um, have multiple, you can say hostra, but every one of these is called a hostrum. And then these little lumpy things here are called epiplotic appendages or omental appendages. We have no idea what they do. We know they exist. We're not sure what they're there for. Just FYI. Okay, so as we get to the sigmoid colon, it eventually turns into the rectum and then finally the anal canal. The anal canal is like two, three centimeters. It's not that much um, space. But at the anal canal, we have two sphincters. We've got an internal anal sphincter and an external anal sphincter. Now, the internal anal sphincter is made out of smooth muscle, meaning that we have no control over it. The minute that fecal material hits it, we go, oh, I'll go to the bathroom, because it relaxes automatically. Something hits it and it relaxes. The external anal sphincter, however, is skeletal muscle, meaning that it is voluntarily controlled. This is the one that when we feel like we got to go to the bathroom, but we're not in a good place to do it, we go, oh and we close it and keep it closed until we can actually get to the bathroom and go. So again, looking at the model, you've got the ileocecal valve, the cecum, there's the appendix, the ascending colon, there's the right colic flexor, the transverse colon, left colic flexor, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, the anus is actually down below that on the model. Each one of these is a hostra, and then that white strip is that tenai coli, okay? There's the tenai coli, there's the epiplotic appendage or the omental appendage, depending. Each one of these lumps, like I said, is a hostra, and then, well, they've got another picture of that. But this is just, kind of filleted open so that you can see from the inside. Um, yeah, from outside to the inside. There we go. 
So looking at the wall of the large intestine, it is quite a bit different than our small intestine. Our small intestine had wrinkles on top of wrinkles on top of wrinkles, right? Well, this guy really doesn't. Yes, I've got some um, villi, but it's nothing like what we saw in the small intestine. Um, we've got these pits here that are called crypts. We've got the mucosa, the lining, the submucosa. We got the muscularis, and again, you've got the circular layer and you've got the longitudinal layer, just the two. And then outside, we've got um, the serosa. And as you can see, even in the large intestine, we've got those lymphatic nodules, basically to help try and protect us. So taking a closer look, see these big white cells? These are called goblet cells. And the reason they call them goblet cells is because it looks like a goblet, like a champagne flute. You've got kind of this top and this kind of thin base to it. <clears throat> Admitted, they didn't do a good job showing that here. You've got the epithelial cells. Again, the lamina propria is that kind of connective tissue underneath um, and the crypt. So see all these white cells here? These are the goblet cells. They're actually making mucus. The crypt is that space that goes down. We've got the muscularis mucosae and the submucosa and this is actually the mucosa. So here are the crypts. You can actually see them. See all the white cells? Those are going to be the goblet cells. Um, you've got the muscularis mucosae, and again, that connective tissue in the middle, the lamina propria. So this would be your mucosa. This would be your submucosa. Now, speaking of accessory organs, we've got the liver. The liver actually creates or makes bile. So bile emulsifies fats, meaning that it takes big flat fat globules and it makes it into smaller flat go fat globules. It's not that it um, breaks it down enzymatically. It's literally just kind of separating it into smaller pie pieces. So since it does that and it does take that bile and um, injects it basically into the beginning of the small intestine, it's considered an accessory organ. So your liver has a right lobe and a left lobe and this right here is the falciform ligament. The falciform ligament holds your liver to the front of your abdominal cavity. Down here, this little green thing peeking out is actually the gallbladder. And then you've got the ligamentum teres. So in the model, right lobe, left lobe, there's the falciform ligament right here, the round ligament and the gallbladder. Same old, same old. So I took the liver and I picked it up like this so that you could see it. There's my right lobe and my left lobe. There's the gallbladder. This green thing that's peeking out is actually under there, okay? There's the ligamentum teres. This is actually the quadrate lobe and the caudate lobe. There's this area here called the bare area. And you see this white lining here? This is the coronary ligament. Let's see. Mm -hmm. The lesser omentum is actually going to be what holds the stomach underneath the liver. Um, now, here in the middle, do you see these tubes that have been cut so they look like lifesavers? This is the porta. One of the things that happens with the food that we are absorbing is it kind of has to be processed before I'm going to allow it to go anywhere. So I take it through a portal vein. Uh, if anybody watches sci-fi, you know what a portal is, or Doctor Who for that matter, you know what a portal is. It goes from my intestines to my liver for processing. So if you look here, see that big old huge vein right there in blue? This is the hepatic portal vein. Anytime you hear hepatic, that means liver, just like gastro meant stomach, hepatic means liver. For the gallbladder, it's cystic. If you hear cystic, that's gallbladder. So I've got the hepatic portal vein. 
And then I've got the hepatic ducts. Notice that they are in green, right? These two actually carry bile, that product that I was talking about earlier. The gallbladder is actually um, made, I guess, to um, hold bile. So the liver makes it and ships it to the gallbladder. The gallbladder concentrates it five times, I believe, makes it more concentrated so less does more. And then when it's needed, it injects that bile into the small intestine, just like the liver does. Now the liver is still making bile and still injecting it itself, but it's just not as concentrated as what the gallbladder made. That's why when somebody gets their gallbladder removed, it's not that big of a deal because the liver is still making it. The only problem is if you need like highly concentrated bile, you're not making that anymore. So that doesn't work out so well. Instead, you get things like diarrhea. Okay. Now, the last thing in this porta is this red thing right here. This is the hepatic artery. So is the liver a living thing inside your body? Well, yes, it has living cells, right? So it does need freshly oxygenated blood. That's what that hepatic artery does. It carries freshly oxygenated blood to the liver cells. Okay, so again, picked it up. You've got the gallbladder, the quadrate lobe. There's the porta, the caudate lobe. That's just the inferior vena cava. The bare area, there's that coronary ligament, the right lobe, the left lobe, the ligamentum teres. Okay? Now, up close and personal. It's just this zoomed in, okay? Gallbladder. There's my bile duct in green, my hepatic portal vein in purple, and my hepatic artery in red. Ligamentum teres is still there, left lobe, right lobe, caudate lobe, bare area, coronary ligament, and none of that has changed. All I'm really doing is I'm pointing this out. Okay, so now looking down. So we did this, now we're tipping it this way so you can see the top. See this? This is the coronary ligament. Remember I talked about the fact that the diaphragm is here and the stomach is like right next to where the heart would be? This actually holds your liver up to the underside of the diaphragm. That's why they're calling it the coronary ligament. Excuse me. There's your inferior vena cava, left lobe, right lobe, still the falciform ligament that holds you to the anterior um, cavity, esophagus, coronary ligament extends over here. There's that gallbladder sticking out. Okay, so again, same picture except it's just the model. You've got the bare area, right lobe, left lobe, um, falciform ligament in the front and then the coronary ligament on top. This is the bare area, um, the second part of the bare area, and there's that caudate lobe and the inferior vena cava. So looking at the liver microscopically, internally in the liver, we have these lobules, the liver lobules or hepatic lobules inside that are going to be um, hexagons, six-sided, okay? They have this central um, vein, okay? And here are my liver cells. See them right there? Kind of looks like a honeycomb. Each one of those little units is going to be a liver cell. They make basically like a brick wall. And each one of these brick walls is called a hepatic cord. So it's hepatic liver cord, so wall. I want you to notice that at the corner of every single part of this hexagon, I've got these three things right here, a red, a blue, and a green, okay? So the green is the hepatic duct, it's carrying bile. The blue is the hepatic portal vein. This is what's bringing that nutrient rich, oxygen poor blood into the liver for processing. And then the hepatic artery is carrying the oxygen rich blood to feed the cells. So this right here is called the portal triad because it's three, triad. 
as this comes in, I want you to notice that these two things merge together and they're going right in between the cells, right? So these cells that are right next to this are actually pulling stuff out of it, like oxygen and some of the nutrients that may need to be processed. And then if they process that nutrient, they don't need it for themselves, they'll dump it back in. When that happens, that product goes here to this um, central vein, okay? And it ends up going back into general circulation around the body. Um, the other thing that the hepatocytes do, hepato, liver, site, cells, is they make bile. Remember I said that's one of the jobs of the liver, it makes bile. Well, these bile canaliculi are embedded in between the cells and they all merge into this hepatic duct at the end. So I'm making bile, but instead of putting it into general circulation, now I'm putting it into the canaliculi that take it out to the corners. So if you're good in a nutrient, you're supposed to go back in the body, you go toward the center of this hexagon. If your bile that's going to be um, excreted either to the gallbladder or into the intestine, you go out toward the corners. You're not going in toward the center anymore. So... <clears throat> Those bile canaliculi basically take the bile and eventually, remember that bile duct we saw on the bottom half of the liver? That's where that's going. So, see the hexagon? You've got the central canal, central canal, that central vein. You've got the lobule, and on every corner, you're going to have a portal area. So, portal area, right? Up close and personal. Here's the lumen of the portal vein. Remember, veins always look like a deflated balloon. They don't have like a really structured um, wall to them. So that's the lumen of the portal vein. See how thick this is though? This is going to be the hepatic artery. The bile duct, the bile duct is always going to look rough and tumble. It doesn't look like a vein. It doesn't look like an artery. See all that purple? Those are bile ducts. Now remember something. See how they're all packed together? You're going to have units of these in every corner. So don't freak out if you see multiples. That's normal. So here's one hepatic cord. Here's one of those walls. See the blood here, the blood there? Remember this sinusoid here where they combine together? That's where the sinusoid is. That's why you see blood cells there. And then this is one of the hepatocyte nuclei, one of the liver cells nuclei. Then we have the pancreas. So the pancreas is, again, one of those things that delivers product into the beginning of the small intestine. So you've got the head of the pancreas, you've got the body of the pancreas, and the tail of the pancreas at the end. The head of the pancreas looks like it's trying to snuggle into the duodenum of the small intestine. Dead center, you have this duct. These cells here, these acini cells here, are actually making all of the pancreatic um, enzymes that help us to digest our food. So they're pouring that into these ducts. Remember, duct is just a fancy way of saying tube. So you've got these intercalated ducts. You've got them merging together into an intralobular duct. And then it becomes the interlobular duct, okay? So this duct right here. And as they come in, they eventually become, basically merge with this pancreatic duct that also merges with the common bile duct. See that? It's green. It carries bile. So these have this major duodenal papilla where they basically dump their product into the duodenum. There's a secondary duct called the accessory pancreatic duct. Okay, the accessory pancreatic duct that has a minor duodenal papilla, a smaller opening that will also dump product into this. Now, 
I know that for, um, <clears throat> well, for, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anatomical purposes. You also know that this is the um, pancreatic islet because you learned that for the endocrine system. So we've got these Acini cells and we've got the pancreatic islet. When you look at a, a picture of the pancreas, you can still see the pancreatic islet, but all of these purple cells that we really weren't paying attention to before, these are the acenus or acini cells that are producing those digestive enzymes that help us to actually process our food. Okay, so that's the last of the digestive system lecture.